Through my company and my personal portfolio, I've worked on over a thousand property deals. But 18 years ago, I had absolutely nothing. No experience, no properties, and no money. And the road from zero to all these properties was absolutely brutal. I made hundreds of mistakes. I missed out on literally millions of pounds along the way. So if I could go back in time and speak to the 22 year old Rob, what advice would I give him to avoid all those stupid mistakes and make better investment decisions? Well, I've managed to summarize 18 years of property experience into five lessons. And although I can't actually help my younger self, hopefully this helps you avoid some of the same traps that I fell into. But before we get into the exact lessons, I need to quickly tell you my story so you can understand how we got here. I'd made some money from running a business and decided that property was the place to invest in. So I made my first investment back in 2006 and it is no exaggeration to say I didn't have the first clue what I was doing. I viewed a grand total of two properties near where I lived in London. The first was above a shop that had highly suspect people hanging around at all hours of the day and night. The second wasn't. So I bought that one. By pure luck, it turned out well. And even when the financial crisis sent the value of my property crashing, it wasn't enough to put me off. Next time I had the cash saved up, I bought in London again. And by this time, I discovered online property forums. So I managed to do a little bit more research. There came a point though, that I just couldn't afford to buy in London anymore. So I started looking further afield. The first place outside London that I bought was Liverpool, where I invested in a student HMO. I didn't know anything about HMOs and didn't know a whole lot about Liverpool, to be honest, but I knew that they produced a higher income than normal lets. And income from my portfolio was what I cared about because by this point, I'd stopped working and started traveling and was trying to establish myself as a freelancer. Income from my portfolio meant that I could support myself as we traveled the world, even at times when the freelance work wasn't coming in. As time went on, I started actually working in property, co-founding Property Hub and the Property Podcast back in 2013. And by spending all day every day immersed in the industry, I became exposed to the many, many different ways that you could invest in property, including student lets, rent to rent and development projects. And because I was very enthusiastic and to be honest, a bit greedy, I decided to try all of them. And before I knew it, I had a portfolio that was a complete mishmash. What was supposed to be a hands-off way of generating income while I traveled was quickly becoming a full-time job. I found myself having phone calls about refurb budgets in Barcelona and having to wake up in the middle of the night in New York to call estate agents to try to hurry along the sale of a house I was flipping. But by this point, I actually had a full-time job in property and couldn't handle my portfolio being another one. So when the pain became severe enough, I started to whip it into some semblance of shape. I stopped with the flips and the developments. I sold some of the more time-intensive properties like my student lets and started buying properties that I believed would perform the best over the long term. Because by now, income wasn't a factor. I had not income from business. So what I was looking for with my portfolio was something that would be low hassle and would grow in value by as much as possible over the next decade or more. So that's how I got here. I now own a good quality, low hassle portfolio that does produce an income, but also just sits there in the background, steadily growing in value. And by the way, if you'd rather just have someone else do all of this for you, our business helps cash rich, time poor investors build long-term portfolios. There's a link to that in the description. Anyway, having done all this and knowing what I do now, what five things would I tell myself if I could go back and have a stern word with the 20 something Rob. Well, firstly, I would have delegated a lot more from the start. I'm not talking about using people to help me source property or having a dedicated PA or any of the things I do now. I just mean not doing literally everything myself. I painted an entire property myself, which took forever and still didn't look great by the time I finished. I spent an entire weekend trying and failing to fit a self-closer to a fire door. And even when I started buying outside London, I got involved in furnishing one of my HOAs. For some reason, driving three hours to Liverpool and three hours back, just so I could do a run to Argos for some bedding that I probably could have paid someone to do for 50 quid. It was very inefficient. Trying to save a few hundred pounds here and there ended up costing me tens of thousands in lost time because I wasn't able to buy as much property as I could have done. And as you'll see, this becomes important later on. You'll remember that with my first property, I bought the second one I ever saw. And while I did start getting a bit more selective after that, I should have been much more selective, more greedy even, and only settled for very good deals 
rather than average ones. And when other people brought opportunities to me, I should have said no more often. I was too keen to see the best in every deal and look for ways to make it work, but I should have done the complete opposite and been as critical as possible. There's no such thing as a perfect deal and you're never gonna find a property that ticks every single box. But I could have skipped a whole load of investments that were more hassle than they were worth and freed up my time and my cash for something far better. When I started investing, income was what mattered to me. But then, as I've said, my circumstances changed. I established a source of income from a business, so I didn't need the income from property anymore. But it took me far too long to notice. For years, I kept on making the same income-focused investments, even though this came at the expense of potential capital growth, because there's always a trade-off. I repeatedly turned down investments where the growth potential was strong purely because they didn't hit my arbitrary yield target that didn't even matter anymore. What I should have done and what I tell other people to do is to have a written business plan. Nobody else ever needs to see it, and it might only be a few bullet points, but it forces you to think through your goals and strategy so you have something that guides your activity. Then, critically, set an appointment with yourself to review it every year. You're always investing based on your circumstances today and what you think they might be in the future, but things change, and I'd be a lot richer today if I'd had these annual check-ins and, as a result, changed my strategy sooner. As you've heard, I went through a phase of dabbling with just about every investment strategy out there. The shiny object syndrome was real, and this had two major drawbacks. The first was that I spent far more time on my investments than I needed to, because every time I made a deal, I was learning a whole load of things about it from scratch. Rather than drawing on my previous knowledge and doing the same thing again, I was having to pour tens of hours into figuring out something new. And to make it worse, it wasn't even financially worth it, because, of course, I was taking on extra risk by going outside my circle of competence. As a result, I ended up losing money on a few conversions and developments because I costed them up wrongly. So if I could go back in time, I would tell younger Rob to keep things simple and stay in his lane. I wanted to do everything because I was so excited by property, but investing isn't meant to be exciting. I should have got my thrills elsewhere and made my investments as boring as possible. The closer you can get to a cookie cutter process where you do the same thing every time, the better. The final piece of advice that I'd give myself would be to recognize a golden opportunity for buying and absolutely fill your boots. So what do I mean by this? Well, not long after I started investing, we had the great financial crisis. And although that didn't put me off investing, I didn't realize at the time that this was the buying opportunity of the next two decades. What I should have done was invest everything I had and beg, steal and borrow money from anywhere to buy as much property as possible. Why? Because there was basically no downside. Property prices had already collapsed. They were only gonna go in one direction. And in London in particular, where I'd been buying, they went up in that direction very, very quickly. I could have made hundreds of thousands of pounds more if I'd just known it was the time to be bold. Over the time I've been investing, I've just consistently bought year on year. But what I should have done is hold back a bit when markets are super strong, use those strong markets to sell properties into that aren't quite working, and got absolutely nuts at times when the market was in the doldrums. But that tactic only makes sense if you actually understand property and you can predict where and when prices will rise or fall. So check out this video next, where I explain two simple calculations anyone can use to predict the property market.